Welcome to the show, bro. Hey, man. I'm, I'm excited to be here. Yeah, this is awesome. so cool. Uh, yeah. yeah. Um, Clip, what do I prefer? I mean, whatever. I'm not going to be picky about it. Right. I think the vast majority of people call me Cliff, mm -hmm. but I've had every nickname under the sun. Nice. So, like, do you want to yeah. know some of them? What's your favorite? Okay. List them off. Uh, Cliptonitis. Nice. Uh, Clip, Clipton Cup of Soup. Uh, Cliptosaurus Rex. That's a good one. Um, uh, uh, <laughs> this one was a funny one. Uh, Cliptoner Pop a Boner. Oh no! <laughs> so I used to, I got I got Clifford the Big Red Dog a lot, obviously yeah. throughout my entire life. Keith Cliff Huxtable nice. uh, from the Cosby's. So uh, yeah, there's been a lot. I, I used to have kids that would like wow. jump on me and fall off and mm -hmm. be like, I just fell off a cliff. Those sons of bitches. Right? <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, That's so my real. full name is Clifton Nicholas yeah. Henry Eli Skeletor. Skeletor. Nice. Yeah. What about you? So. You, like, I, I've told you this already. So, Glenn, you have the same uh, first name as my grandpa. Oh, no kidding? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, the infamous Glenn yes. Skeletor. How does he spell it? One N or two? Oh, jeez. I believe he spelt it with one N, I think. My dude. Yeah. My dude. Sounds like a good man. And uh, so my mother uh, is from a little town called Clarny. You know what Clarny is? Oh, yeah. Just on the other side of Sudbury. Familiar? Uh, yeah, Clarny is uh, awesome. I loved it as a kid. As a teenager, I thought it was lame. And as an adult, I think it's awesome again, right? Yeah, that's kind of the, the cycle. Yeah. The cycle. And uh, my grandfather, that's where he's from, and he was a big-time hockey player. Nice. So, uh, yeah, he was uh, kind of well-known on Manitoulin Island. I'll tell you a story, okay? So, Do it. so get I'll get tell the audience it. a story, I'm going to tell Let's you a story, okay? It. I don't waste any time. <laughs> nice. So the first time I ever met a billionaire, Okay. I never really, maybe I met one, didn't know it, but the first time I knew I was meeting a billionaire um, was a few years back. I was in Toronto. I was at this thing, uh, a friend of mine who was looking for investment in his company. Mm -hmm. I ended up having a few people come over. Now, this is going to drive me crazy. The guy's father was called the Barracuda of Bay Street, and I'm going to forget his I'm going to forget his name That's right incredible. now. It'll come to me. But he was like the Canadian version of the Wolf of Wolf Wall Street. Street eh? Right? He was the uh, Barracuda of Bay Street. And uh, somebody watching this could look it up. And So I met his son. And his son was also there with um, uh, another guy. Again, I'm terrible. I'm screwing the story up because I don't remember their name. But he was the grandson of the guy that created London Life, which is a huge no insurance company. Both these guys are very well off. And uh, so they're from down south. I'm from here in Sudbury. Yeah. I meet this guy who is the heir to London Life. And yes. I say my name. He goes, you know, we're introducing uh, each other. And I say, I'm Cliff Skeletor. So my last name is Skeletor, which is not a common last name. No, it doesn't sound like it. We literally can't find that name anywhere. Another one of my nicknames as a kid was Skeletor from He-Man. Nice. Uh, and Helter Skelter, yes. Charles Manson. Yeah. And uh, just skeleton in general. And immediately he recognizes the last name. And he looks at me and he goes, Glenn Skeletor. And I look at him like, okay, what, what's happening right yeah. now? Like, is this real life? My like, grandfather. I'm like, yeah, that's my grandfather. He goes, I know about that guy. He's like, one of my kind of side things is I'm a bit of a hockey historian. And I remember your grandfather, Glenn Skeletor, used uh, to tear up the scene in Manitoulin Island. And... I was what? just like, my jaw was on the ground. Like, I was so unexpected. And, nice. uh, yeah, I mean, the story goes that, like, he had been drafted to the NHL a couple of different times, but he had to turn it down because apparently things were different back in those days. So, like, it was, like, I think it was, like, just, there was just six teams. Uh, oh, they, back in the day. Yeah, there was, like, you didn't actually get paid very much at all. And uh, I think that you know, maybe he was starting a family, just couldn't reasonably do it. I, I can't really, really remember the full details, but, yeah. you know, Google it. Glenn Skeletor, he pops up, actually. That's it. Yeah. Right. And my uncle Clifford, whom I'm partially named after, was a war hero. Oh, Clifford no Skeletor received the Purple Heart. I wow. Google that as well. I think that's Jeez, pretty cool. Well, yeah. That's it. Yeah, so yeah, wow. that's, that's random background nice. for you, Glenn. Appreciate that, though. Wow. Yeah. Hey, yeah. so... Um, I'm curious though. I'll, I'll get to my agenda in a sec, but now I'm curious. What wars? Oh, geez, I'm guessing World War Two. Yeah, yeah, that's what sense. I'm thinking. Yeah, I should know more, so I don't. I, 
I I actually am a little bit embarrassed to admit that I I I, I don't know my family history as much as I should. Yeah, and in the do. past few years, I've really taken more of an interest in nice. it. Um, you know, just. I don't know why, for some reason, I was maybe so focused on the now all the time and yeah, the future that, that I wasn't looking at the past, but I've really come to appreciate history mm -hmm. more than I ever have yeah. because there are things, there's so much we can learn about it. So, 100%. you know, my mom's from Killarney, uh, but like our ancestry on that side was, uh, is Irish and uh, Ojibwe. Oh, cool. And so my great-grandfather, John Skeletor, was actually a residential school survivor. And wow. so there's kind of legendary stories in our family, really hard and sad stories about, you know, him being brought to these residential schools, escaping, walking like, you know, hundreds of kilometers to get back home, wow. hiding in the house so that the authorities wouldn't come back, grab him and bring him back to the residential schools. It's like, yeah, it's, it's, it's hard to believe wild, that that stuff yeah. even happened. And then, really? On my father's side, my father's from Trinidad. Nice. So Trinidad's in the Caribbean. Yes. Um, French Virgin Islands. Yeah. You, yeah, and it was, you know, at one point a colony, right? Yeah. Uh, under the British monarchy, and, and people were brought over there for the sugarcane fields. Mm -hmm. And, uh, yeah, they were only granted their, their freedom in, I think, the 60s or 70s. Wow. Like, um, so that's a whole fascinating story too. Yeah, I mean, yeah. like, who I, you didn't even think we would get here, right? Yeah, that's sick. So there's some interesting stuff. Yeah, no kidding. What about you? What's your What's your heritage? So I know, far back as, Monona, was born in northern Italy. Mm. I'm trying to remember. There's like four names to describe the town or okay. for the town. It's a lot of uh, places like that, little villages and stuff. Uh, two hours north of Venice, and I know, my grandfather was born in the UK. Um, and I think his grandfather was born in was in Ireland, so I know okay. it comes from like a more like Western Europe. Okay. So I know that's kind of how it starts, and uh, anywhere past there, like, like you said, similar. I don't know as much as I maybe should. Yeah. But history in general interests me, so I definitely should be piping back to go uh, go look. But I only noticed uh, for myself at least why I took more of an interest in learning where everyone was from and how everyone was connected. Was when I started to visit those like that's my right. family so, in other countries. That's right? right. So I had over kind of overheard the other day when we were over at our friend's Andre's house, yeah. who was shout on. Andre. Uh, shout out to Andre. The link for his episode will be right here. Yeah, there you go. It's up there. And so Andre and Mitch go on, you know, yeah. and so they had mentioned that you traveled. So tell me a little bit about that. <laughs> yeah. So my Europe adventures were kind of it was pretty spontaneous, um, as much as we had planned it out, we had made the idea verbal to uh, each other. So first of all, in uh, 2017, when school went on strike uh, for colleges, I came back for a week. And in that week, uh, shout out to my good buddy, James Holden. He, uh, him and I had always had the same, like I was moving him into his house and him and I had the same idea of we want to travel. We both finished, he finished his nursing degree. I finished my architectural technology diploma. So we finished and we were like, hey, I want to travel to Europe when I'm done, but not the go to the app, not the average places because everywhere in Europe is like crazy. But a lot of people I find will go to Paris, yeah. they'll go to Spain, or they'll go to France, Spain, and then Italy, and then we'll do kind of those three or four, maybe Portugal, and yeah. they'll go to all these big cities in these places. And my buddy James and I had the idea of doing it a little bit differently, and that's what inspired almost my travel series on my YouTube page, where it's a lot of he, his goal was to recreate the most epic photos of these locations throughout Europe. Oh, very fun. And so my job was I was along the adventures with him, and we each picked places, and he would pick photos in the places I picked and uh, vice versa, and I would okay. almost go with him on this adventure, be the co-pilot to it, and vlog or video document the whole thing. So I have videos of me in the like Monte Carlo Casino, being like, this is what it's like, because those are the photos you want to take, or that's I want to awesome. take and stuff, so. And so that's up now? A uh, couple of them. I only have, like, the us going through Serbia, and us going through Bosnia and Herzegovina. Wow. Yeah, so those are okay. the two, but. So I'm going to check that yeah. out. So Absolutely. you should leave a link for that somewhere. Yeah, definitely will in the description. Just floating or here, or yeah. there, wherever it is. Okay, oh. I want to check that yeah. out. Those were, uh, and I was looking up some videos on you today as well, and... And like one of them was, you do one where it's like how to be more confident 
on camera. Okay, fun. So I, yeah. Yeah. Okay, so sorry, I yeah. cut you off. Oh, good. But I have one little tidbit with that. Was I was like, man, the one thing that really made me better at it was I just have to do it. And it's like yeah. you could get used to hearing your voice, man. You can yeah. imagine how many times I hear my voice if I listen to these back. Oh yeah. And so I'm just like, you get used to it when your camera's up in your hand and you're in Paris and people are looking at you everywhere. <laughs> and you feel and like, ridiculous. What's going on? You look and feel ridiculous. Yeah, yeah. I'm wearing this exact hat, yeah. a red shirt on, I got my giant pit viper sunglasses. Yeah. <laughs> I look completely outrageous, but at the end of yeah. the day, that's what I needed to do in the time. That's what I had to wear. And that's yeah, I think it is. we end up feeling silly so easily, yeah. right? I mean, I think that's part of being self-aware. You're probably yeah, a self-aware person. Yeah. And so I that moment so. when we are children, we look in the mirror and we we realize that we are a thing and we exist, yeah. right? Not just the things that we're seeing, that we are actually one of the things right. that yeah. others can see, right? And from that moment on, that's when, you know, that's when it all starts to get really wild in our minds. We're aware of our movements, how we want to represent mm -hmm. ourselves, how we want to be presented, how we don't want to be presented. Right. That's a big one, is that you fear of like, I don't want to come across this way. Okay, I get yeah. it. Understandable. Um, and so thank you for giving my YouTube channel a shout out. Absolutely. And I do apologize to my YouTube channel for not giving it love in the last month. Because yeah. I did kind of make a promise to myself that I broke. Sorry, it happens. Uh, that I would uh, kind of be more consistent yeah. with it. And I'm going to be completely honest. I got derailed by, um, you know, the cultural stuff that's happening in the world today. 100%. Uh, I got mentally derailed by it. And I'm not saying that's a bad thing or a good thing. It just made it really difficult for me to continue that the videos that I was doing. They felt really empty, even though I know that they are important for people that are, you know, uh, you know, I talk about things like yep. trying to build your confidence, mm -hmm. how to edit a video, like things yeah. like that that uh, could be helpful for any young professional or older professional. One hundred percent, good skills to have. Anybody in general. So I got a little uh, thrown off. Um, and I, I've been kind of going back and forth at whether I want to talk about some of the cultural things mm -hmm. on the YouTube channel or if I want to just continue with more, um, you know, giving people some tools to work with, right? Because right? mm -hmm. uh, for me, and I'll just give you a little, you know, background. I mean, you know, I've been an entrepreneur for about 12 years now. Mm -hmm. I started my, uh, my, uh, my business, even though it's changed names multiple times and, and we'll get into, uh, you know, as we go, we'll get into yeah. all those things. And, you know, I didn't know anything. I don't come from a family of entrepreneurs. Um, I was raised by a single mother that was a social worker at Children's Aid, did great work there. And, uh, I just had to learn entrepreneurship on my own. Mm -hmm. And so I'm just trying, I think I always have this thing where I want to help other people yeah. with the things that I needed help with. Um, okay, I see. Even though I realize that if you really want, let's say it's entrepreneurship, you know, that's something I think yeah. about a lot. I've worked with hundreds and hundreds of entrepreneurs throughout mm -hmm. my career. Uh, it's something that I, I have a very intimate and uh, personal relationship yeah. with. I, uh, I, I just want to help those entrepreneurs, but I also realize that if you really want to be an entrepreneur, nothing will get in your way. You'll just, you'll just it'll do it'll it. Just happen. It, you'll just do it. You won't give up on it. You'll become so obsessed with it. And entrepreneurs watching this right now are going, yep, yeah. yep, 100%. yep. And maybe people that are uh, not entrepreneurs yet, but thinking about it will be going, do I have it in me? Because you do ask yourself that. Yeah. Um, but yeah, yeah. So that that's why I'm just always mm -hmm. trying to help. Uh, yeah. with those types of tools, right? Right, and that's similar to why this show kind of came to fruition. Yeah, yeah, I want to know more about where that. It's, um, <laughs> a lot of it had to do... I had done one with my with a friend of mine, and it was, it was weak. There wasn't much <laughs> substance to it. I would yeah. ask questions, and it was kind of... I would be trying to get so in-depth in what their story is to learn as much about their perspective and the way yeah. they see things as I could. And then he's trying to ask semi-inappropriate questions that I have yet to ask or will ever ask on the show. Well, it was, he, he was and just trying to make it funny, so he was going yeah. overboard with the level. Yeah. Some people, like depending on the guests, like one guest would be okay with it and the other would not be. And it's like, oh, well, that kind of derails the whole train of what the show is. Yeah. So it was kind of tricky. And then, anyway, it fell apart. Um, it's kind of focused. I was like, man, how do I, I want to do one. I want to do one. I want to do one. I'm going to do one. How do I go about doing it? And then I found this concept with life after high school, hence mm. the name of the show, 
Um, there's a lot of issues people have and unanswered questions specifically with the transition. Yes. From middle of high school when they have to start, start thinking about yeah, it. Yeah, exactly, yeah. right? And then to graduating, then now that they graduated, what, do you end now? Now that you're done school, you get in a job and do it? Or how do you go out on your own? Or you see all these people doing so many different things. You're like, well, I don't know what to do. Yeah. And then how do you make those questions? Or how do you invest? How do you do this? How do you do that? How do you start a business? How do you start a business if you're young and have very little experience? Yeah. Or don't know what skills you might have? Or yeah. what do you do in this transition? What if you don't like school or the way they teach in school? And it's like, that's what we're here to do. That's what we're here to do. Those are the questions All, we want to Maybe answer. alleviate some of the terror and anxiety, but also re exactly. reiterate that the terror and anxiety is actually yeah. important. And it's real. And it's not going to break you. No. Nope. It's not going to kill you. Uh, high school is a weird time, right? Yeah, it's, it's, a, you, you t it's, <laughs> it's this four or five year block in your life that seems to carry through, to, uh, for some people, the rest of their life. Their right. high school experience. Yeah. It's, it's just a weird stage. I mean, think yeah. about all the hormones. Think about, yeah. like, everything you're discovering. Like, when it's I nuts. look back at high school, most of the first that society really puts a lot of emphasis on mm -hmm. happen in that period, right? Yeah. Yeah. And, man, there's so many emotions. I remember, I, I'll never forget mm -hmm. my first day of high school. Yeah, Why do I remember that one day so well? Of all the days we oh, yeah. exist, yeah. that day is so important. I remember being so nervous. Yeah. I remember yeah. just staring at that sheet with your, and where the, and you're like, where is this class? Yeah, you know right? maybe one person in the class. Trying to recognize somebody you know and then just stick beside them in the hallway and be like, we're going to find this together. <laughs> right? Yeah. You're like, 100%. we. And some of those friends you meet then, you kind of, this bond through this like this fear and anxiety <laughs> that you create sometimes it yeah. carries all the way through it's high nice. school. Yeah, it does. I remember so first semester, grade nine, mm -hmm. LaSalle Secondary nice. School, Lancers. coming out of Saint Rayfields. I was a Lancer nice. coming out of Saint <laughs> Rayfields. So I went from the uh, the Catholic school to the public school, mm -hmm. and I was just like, yeah, I didn't want to do Saint Charles. Right. Uh, I wanted to do LaSalle. And uh, getting there, uh, one of my classes was, I think it was photography in grade nice. nine, and taught by Mrs. Holland. Anybody that may have gone to LaSalle may can't know that one. Mrs. Holland was a character. Oh. And I remember this one young man walking in yeah. his back, and he had the leather jacket, and he looked cool, but he wasn't feeling very cool because he was so nervous that as he walked in the class, he just like was very white, and he was doing this thing here. And you're like, oh, this isn't going to be good. And then, well, look. You vomited. All oh, the no. up. And, and kids are the worst, right? Like, imagine this Never guy. That. Everyone was like, oh, right? And he just <laughs> ran out of the class. And uh, Oh, no. I saw the kid again a few weeks later, but I don't know if he was ever the same. Oh, I'd never be the same. I've Horrifying never, experience, yeah. right? Dude, never. But yeah. I, uh, yeah, I have a weird, uh, it's uh wasn't really much friends with them. We got along in high school, but Pat, our trainer now, okay, we nice. graduated the same year, everything, yeah. Oh, really? Yeah, now through Inspired, we're like friends now. Isn't that cool how that happens? Yeah. So, I'll, I mean, kind of maybe a similarity is that over at my agency, my operations director, yeah. Jill Manella, uh, she, uh, we went to high school together. Nice. She was a couple years under me, but like yeah. we all kind of, you know, had similar friends hanging out. Okay, uh, yeah. I was a bit of a floater, you know, I just floated around in groups. I didn't care how old you were. I didn't care if you were a punk or a, yeah. a, 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 a jock or, a, you know, the different groups, right? Yeah. Uh, I was a hip hop head. Nice. Uh, yeah, I was one of those. And then, you know, we hung out with the burnouts and the, uh, the, the, the skaters. We were a bit tighter, but I still went to the preps and the jock mm -hmm. and I loved them as well, which is such a, isn't that the funniest yeah. thing? It's like we get into high school and immediately we already have categories for each other. Yeah. Right? 100%. Yeah. It's like, weird. I don't even know how it happens. It's no like idea. you just walk into that culture of things and you're like, yeah, this is the language yeah. we use. It's so weird. So Jill, anyways, is my operations director. So we always kind of look back at the people we know in common. And, you know, we talked a little bit yeah. back then. But, you know, she's been with me now for two, two, three years. 
and uh, we talk, you know, five days a week. We're nice. building this yeah. thing together, right? So it's kind of cool how yeah, that could absolutely. collide later in life. Yeah. Nice. Right. Now, with that being said, then, take us through what your life has been like after high school, like that transitional period. <sighs> Holy jumping junipers. Okay, right. so you guys go get some snacks right now. <laughs> uh, buckle in. Uh, we're going on a ride. Do it. Uh, <laughs> okay, so how do I give you the Cliff Notes version? Just so you know, Instagram, you know, my it. Instagram, Cliff Notes. It'll Follow be in me. the description. The company hasn't come after me yet, which is wild. Um, Jesus. Yeah, so I'm Cliff Notes, so I'll give you the Cliff Notes version of it. I was a horrible student. Yeah. Horrible student. Uh, I didn't want to really pay attention. I didn't find any of the teachers particularly interesting. I didn't really find the stuff they were teaching us particular. I was not engaged. I was highly engaged in the social aspect of things. I loved going there. I loved being around yeah. my friends. And something that I realized later when I look back on it, I actually really was sad when high school ended. And even though I didn't really like the school aspect, I was so sad to be seeing all of these people I spent the last few years of my mm -hmm. life with going like, well, what if I never see them again, right? Like. Am I not going to see them? Yeah. Like, I'm so used to seeing them every day. Mm -hmm. That was difficult for me. Like, even yeah. the people I didn't really even like, yeah. I was like, yeah, but I like seeing them. Like, that consistency yeah. there. So, immediately after high school, uh, and a uh, little dirty secret, I snuck out of high school without my diploma. Uh, I've shared this before. I don't like to... Sh I don't want to give anybody some ideas. Finish high school, do your high school, do that. Right? I didn't finish high school. And I'll tell you why. Oh, God, how, I'm not giving the cliff notes of this. I'm giving the long version. I failed grade 9 math. I then went to summer school for grade 9 math. Yeah. I started getting off the bus at the beach because the beach was cool and there were girls there. And didn't go to summer school. Went back to high school. Went right into grade 10 math. Okay? And they didn't realize <laughs> until later, until I was about to graduate, that I didn't have my grade 9 math. And they couldn't let me graduate. And I was like, yes, but I'm leaving. Because I'm not going to stay not, here longer. This is it. This and is. so I go to college, and I take advertising. And they are like, we need your diploma, but in the meantime, here's your classes, do your thing, right? And they kept asking for it. And I kept saying, oh, they're supposed to send it over. And I just played that game all the way through. Now, <laughs> okay, right? Now, what's funny is... At the end of it, like, uh, like I went one year into advertising, which is funny because I've owned an advertising agency for a decade now. Mm. But I dropped out of advertising. And the reason why I did that was I told everybody, this is the lie. This is the lie to protect the ego. Oh, it's not for me. Advertising is not for me. But the reality is I started developing some pretty aggressive, like, uh, social anxiety. Yeah. And it was not something that I necessarily experienced in high school. It was just like this thing where I just started like everything was coming at yeah. me, right? Wasn't prepared for it. And so we had to do a lot of public speaking. And I was like, nah, I'm not doing it, right? Weird. And so I dropped out because the second year was like all public. And I'm like, I can't do this. I drop out. Yeah. A couple years later, I realized, okay. So I keep going back. I go back, graphic design semester, go back, take civil engineering, yeah. go back, take police nice. foundation, go. I'm doing this weird thing where I'm just bouncing all over the place. Eventually, I get a general arts diploma. Nice. Then I go to university, take communications minor in film. Okay, so I don't know that I answered your question, but I just wanted to give you a little bit of the chaos of me. Not being able to make a decision, being all over the place, having multiple interests, developing this anxiety, having to self-reflect, um, develop techniques and tools to be able to manage that stuff. And yeah, it was really, it was really challenging. Mm -hmm. Now, what's funny is that I do a ton of public speaking now. Yeah. That's I live awesome for it. Say that. I live for it. I love it. It's bizarre because that's life. Yeah. Sometimes the things you're the most fearful of are the things that you, if you face them again, mm -hmm. exposure therapy guys, Cognitive behavior therapy. Exposure therapy. If I could tell you anything, that's not expose yourself therapy. So <laughs> don't try to, don't get it twisted, guys. Don't get it no, twisted. It's, it's exposure therapy. The things you're fearful of, if you face them, you know, uh, you'll minimize that fear. 100%. We're 
terrified of things we don't know. We are so scared of things we don't know. So the unknown kind of gets it. So, I mean, that's been a big part of my path. And, uh, yeah. Nice. I don't know if that answered your no, question. No, that definitely does. Okay. That definitely does. <laughs> okay. How does that take you to starting... Uh, it's your media productions, right? That's awesome that you... Mel, how did you find out your media productions? How did you figure that one out? You were like, I, I got come, my way. I come prepared. The magician never gives away his I tricks. I come prepared. Okay, so, and also, number one, I jokingly said, I want yellow M&Ms. Just as, just a, <laughs> like, just being a, like a diva type. And I show up here and he actually has yellow M&Ms. And I'm going to eat some of these pretty soon. Uh, just, I want you all to be prepared for that. I forgot the just for men though, dude. I'm sorry about that. Yeah, that's kind of hurtful. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, whatever. We'll, we'll, we'll figure Move that out as that. we go. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah. Uh, um, so, Your Media Productions is my first multimedia business I own, okay? So, that's, oh, God, 10, 11 years ago. Now, again, going back in my story to school, I ended up getting a um, an internship at CTV. Yes. So, it was a three-month unpaid internship. I say that to clarify that. I'm a big believer in if you want something, you do whatever it takes to get it. And some people don't like to hear this, but I, I don't really, I don't really care. I don't really care if you don't want to hear this, yeah. but you got to work for free sometimes. And, yeah. um, you just, because it's not free, it's actually, you're, you're, you're earning information and knowledge. Some people think they deserve to get paid way too soon in the process. That's a very immature thought process. Mm -hmm. And I'm sorry if that triggers you. But that's just the truth, and you have to accept the truth because it's, uh, you become yeah. better at something through practice, practice, practice. We talk about practice. We talk about practice. Not a game. Yes, <laughs> not a game. We talk about practice. Yes, we're talking about practice because when you practice the thing, don't expect to be paid for the thing until you're really good. And once you're really good, you become undeniable. Okay, internship, CTV, did that. Then got a job there, then worked there for three years, then questioned myself. I'm like, oh my God, I thought I wanted a job here. Why am I still miserable? Because I was just miserable with working for somebody else. It's that simple, right? I wanted to see my uh, dream come to fruition. I have a roommate at the time. He's a heck of a salesman. And I say, let's start a business together because people in the field are always asking me when they see me with my camera. They were big cameras we were carrying. Yeah. Uh, uh, do you guys do this on the side? And I would say no. And then eventually I was like, "Why? Well, we should start doing this on the side. Weird. And then that's how it began. And originally when it began, it was designed to just be video production. Yeah. But as people kept asking for more help and I started recognizing they needed yeah. more help, I was able to implement other skills of mine. Nice. And then I was also able to find people I knew that were talented, right? Mm -hmm. Dude, sorry to cut you off, but... Uh, oh, wait, is this commercial break? A, yeah. Okay, this oh, commercial break. A word uh, from our sponsor. A word from the sponsor of the show. What's up, guys? I just want to interrupt this show to give a quick shout-out to my boys over at Big Bush. They are a great, amazing Canadian gear company created because of Instagram with products for the people of Instagram. They look to share the story of how a gear company is created. It's your own one-stop shop for all exclusive, behind the scenes, looks into what creates an amazing gear company. Big Bush, baby. Of course, yeah. All right, guys, thank you, and uh, we're back. Oh my God, that thing is, I hope people get it, or <laughs> do it, or, yeah, whatever it is. Whatever, because that was amazing, man. Was yeah, good. Good, yeah, great spot, good. great thank spot you. from the thank sponsor. You. I'm excited about Sorry, that. Uh, okay, so so back to where I was in regards to just talking about myself and uh, the incredible work and stuff and uh, uh, <laughs> incredible salesman. I think it was that was my business partner. That fell apart. I won't get into the dirty details of that. You know that there's incredible stories. So that partnership fell apart. I was on my own for about a year or two. It was really difficult. My first two years of business were great, uh, and it went to my head. And uh, I remember at one point, probably like year two, I decided to like lease this mansion for a year. This place like 6,000 square feet, indoor pool, like go hard, like too far, get myself a Land Rover. It's like, it's comedic, it's comedically cliche guys. Like it's so dumb. And I mean, that went exactly where it needed to go, like to absolute failure, the business falling apart, me not making like losing clients, not following things, just being focused on the wrong things, right? 
There were fun times, Glenn. I leaked Glenn. a mansion. Glenn. And bought a Range Rover. <laughs> I know. The yeah. stories get, were... Get, what's, uh, what's one that uh, clicks whenever you talk stories. about this story? Yeah. Oh, my Maybe goodness. Go back to that. I mean, I just remember very clearly uh, waking up in the middle of the night, many nights, to having my house full of people from the bar that came over to my place, and they'd be partying in the pool room, wow. and th those were just things that happened. And there might be people even watching this now that remember that, because a lot of people will still bring it up to me to this wow. day. Um, I also was doing this thing where I produced a, uh, uh, a local TV show, nice. the episode. Did you find out anything about that, Glenn? Don't okay, it's all good, because yeah. I'll fill you in on it, Sick, right? Easy. So around this time as well, I decided to take a shot at producing a TV show. And so we end up producing this show that's basically a talk show. Yeah. And, you know, you've got your intro, you know, we had the host, we had a guest, we would have a guest on, uh, then we would have some, like, uh, segments that we pre-recorded, and then we'd have a guest at that. Mm -hmm. We did it in front of a live audience at SRO. Oh, uh, we got it on East Link. Uh, we had our YouTube channel. I think we got up to 32 episodes. Um, we had a lot of interesting guests on it. Uh, yeah, it was it was wild. Now we were barely we weren't getting paid for the thing at all. It was all like an, uh, like uh, like labor of love, as they yeah. say. And so I learned a lot from those years. Um, and you know, I experimented a lot and. Uh, I'm always like exp trying new things and, mm -hmm. and seeing what happens with them and uh, yeah, so that's that's what happened there and then eventually you know Launchpad Creative comes into the picture and it's just a fully evolved version of my first business, Your Media Production, my second business, Society Media, yeah. and then the third one that's been my business for seven and a half years now, which is kind of the evolution of all of those businesses uh, in this branding agency. So tell us more then about uh, strategies you use oh, wow. in your everyday uh, business troubles. Oh, one hundred percent. Oh, those are big, eh? Yeah. Are these the ones with the almonds in the middle? I'm well, peanut. Oh man. Well, okay, you're all right. Oh yeah. Oh, I just fall off camera. Uh, <laughs> you continue with the, and I'll tell you another uh, story. All right, sorry. What I interrupted you. What strategies do you use? in your everyday work to get like to build clients and stuff like that so there's many aspects to the business one of them is business development so are you asking how do i attract clients yes yeah. okay what you go to great question um there's a variety of things that for any business and r it's really tough when you first start off getting your first few clients it's really difficult what ends up happening for a lot of people is it ends up being friends and family, mm. or friends of family, or family of friends. <laughs> I don't know why I find that funny, but I do. Um, and so, first I was just going out. I did the classic stuff. Hello, uh, can I speak to your manager? Can I speak to the owner of the business? You feel so dumb doing it, but do it. Because that's where you cut your teeth. That's where the true... I don't know. Everybody has a different journey. So I have my philosophy. I'm very proud of my history of like mm -hmm. really facing my anxiety, cold calling, getting into place saying, I could help you. I could do this. Um, we could work with you, all that stuff. And then over the years, you refine those skills. But one of them straight up cold calls, straight up walking into places and going, I'd like to work with you feeling super vulnerable, feeling like you're annoying people. Because a lot of times you are annoying people because you're disrupting them. Yeah, there's a process. Or interrupting them. Um, I'm going to put these down right here, okay? I'm going to circle back to these. Sounds good. I'm going to have one more though, right? Oh. All right. Okay. Enjoy it. Enjoy it, dude. So you are interrupting yeah. people. But another one is networking. Mm -hmm. um, go to events. Now, that doesn't mean just... <clears throat> go to industry events that doesn't mean just <clears throat> hold on <laughs> you good everybody wait yeah yeah i'm good i'm good, I'm good. Okay. I'm good. 
just like getting nervous <laughs> have somebody choke on my Yeah, head. could you imagine? This choke is the first. Show. You're like, I demand M and M's, and then I yeah. die that's because the last of it. Time somebody demands any food for the show. Yeah, that's absolutely yeah. It. right. Next time we should have hamburgers, though. Um, so that doesn't mean just going to specific events and handing your cards out. That means like going to coffee shops, uh, going to parties, dinners, things like that. Not pitching people, guys. Okay? I need you to hear this. Don't pitch people. Build relationships. Mm -hmm. Do not pitch people unless you're in an environment that is conducive to pitching people. Don't be that guy or girl. Please, okay? It's not going to do you any good. What you need to do is you need to reach out to your closest friends and you say, Hey, closest friends. I want to go into business and I need to uh, learn how to sell. And the only way I do this is if I pitch to people. Can I practice on you? Nice. Get your friends together and get them to give you honest feedback as you pitch the thing. Some of the feedback is going to be good. Most of it's going to be garbage. It's not about the feedback. It's about feeling what it feels like to speak in front of people and interact off of the emotion they're giving you back. Mm -hmm. You love jiu-jitsu, right? Yeah. You do jiu-jitsu, right? 100%. Do you think you could do it if you just read about it in a book? Negatory. Where have you learned the most about jiu-jitsu? Here. And over, over rolling the around. consistency of oh. it, yes. yes. And rolling yes. around with people, physically yeah. feeling how a body physically moves. And, doing it. Yeah. and going like, when I feel this kind of pressure here, I know to move here. Yeah, and this is how it... And it's hard to describe all the nuances of that unless you're doing it. Yeah. It's no different with pitching. Right. I've pitched like thousands of times in my career. Mm -hmm. Like in front of one person, in front of whole boards of directors, oh, in front of like all sorts of different people. And I wasn't confident at first. I was so nervous to pr pitch at first. I bet. It's yeah. so nerve wracking. Because like you're basically saying, um, tell me I'm good. Yeah. Don't pick me last on the, yeah. the softball team, right? Yeah. Approve of me. Yeah. Right? You're in front of a group of your peers asking or, for your Or not, or at, not at the not time. Even, like, yeah. these are people that are super successful, and you're like, why would they ever want to work with me? Yeah. But you have to believe in yourself. Right. Can I tell you a story? I know, I'm, I know I'm talking. I'm just... 100%. Uh, okay. Uh, I, just, I think that this story is valuable. Yes. It illustrates my mindset. And it also explains how I got to the party. Okay. And let's go back 10 years. Now, there's a company. <laughs> there should be music. <laughs> like a string music. I will. I'll, uh, I'll, I'll add it in for sure. Mm. Okay, about 10 years ago, I, uh, I don't, I'm getting little projects here and there. Mm -hmm. And I decide to approach Cambrian Ford, which is a big dealership in our city here of Sudbury. Yep. I don't know where people are watching from, but it's a big dealership here. And I approached them, Steve and Scott McCullough, and I pitched them this uh, really multimedia campaign that involves social media, building a small website that people could upload videos to. Nice. Just a fully multi-level advertising campaign. And... The pitch went really well. And you got to keep in mind at the time, Instagram doesn't even exist. Right. People don't believe in Facebook yet. People aren't sure about YouTube yet, right? Yeah. So you got to understand, we're pitching like this digital campaign mixed with traditional. At the end of it, uh, Steve McCullough looks at me and he goes, "That's a, I like this idea. Can you give me some examples of other times you've done this? If you're just starting out, this is like the worst question you could ever get. Yeah. Because you don't have any examples. Right. Because you have no experience yet. You have little snippets of different things you've done. And don't lie to them either. Because... <laughs> yeah. um, they'll find out. They'll find out. Yeah, it's worse. Or you'll know in the back of your head. I just don't recommend it. Um, and so he's like, unfortunately, I can't responsibly hire you for this project, right? I mean, I've got... You know, I just can't. We can't spend the money on this, and I can't take that chance on you. Now, at the time, I just so happened to know that they need the outside of their building painted. If you know the building, it's a huge building. Yeah. Also, if you know me, you know that I don't don't paint. I don't paint. I don't even paint the inside of an apartment. I don't know how to paint. 
I, how about this, Steve? I'll paint this building for half the cost anybody else will do it for if you consider me for this project. He says, I can't say no to that. You're hired. So I then go on YouTube, go, how do you paint a building? <laughs> I rent scissor lifts. I hire a couple of guys. I tell them it's going to take six weeks to do this project. Now, we start painting the building. At the six-week point, we have 5% of the building done. It is <laughs> way harder. What? Way harder than I expected. The rolling on the paint, uh, the making sure it's matching. The I'm all, so much, yeah. at the time, and I still am pretty nervous with heights, being in this scissor lift that's just like constantly swaying. <laughs> just constant, right? Yeah. Every day, and it's, oh, it's the worst, right? Um, and so, uh, wow, at one point in this process, <laughs> I don't know what gets into us. I just think exhaustion and... Like, we lose reasonable thinking, and we decide we're going to start spraying the paint on. Because in our minds, this is a smart idea. In a parking lot filled with brand new vehicles to start spraying s small particles of paint onto a building seemed like a good idea. Was not a good idea. Steve McCullough comes running out, freaking out. Oh, my God, what are you doing? Stop. We get paint over I'm talking millions of dollars in damages. I'm done. I'm done. In an alternate reality, in another dimension, sliding doors, this, my career was done at that point. Wow. I was probably in jail or something. Somehow find this clay that could remove the paint without affecting the car's paint, get the paint off the car's, finish the paint job. Somehow, I have no idea how, Steve McCullough comes out, looks at me, he goes, holy jeez, I would have given up. 10 times in this process is like if you work half as hard on something you care about as what you I saw you work on this thing that I know you don't care about you're gonna do a great job you're hired can you believe he actually hired me wow. he took a chance on me because I showed grit I showed resilience and I also showed um, a willingness to do something that wasn't my job like the, to that's all cheap. the, to all the, that's not my job people out there, you know, I'm going to shove that in your face a little bit because the reality is everything's your job in an effort to achieve the goals that you want to achieve in your life. You do what it takes. You don't mm -hmm. let your ego get in the way and go like, I'm too good to do that. I'm a video. I'm a market. I'm a man. Right. And so I got the gig and, uh, nice. at the time we created the slogan, my Cambrian Ford, which is still to mm -hmm. this day, see on vehicles they were using. It's not just a Ford, it's a Cambrian Ford. And then we came in with my Cambrian Ford. We launched the campaign. It was a big success. You know, we got them on yeah. Facebook, got people uploading videos. We gave away a free car. It was just a, a, a nice. wicked success. Yeah. And yeah, yeah, man, that's pretty sweet. It's all been ups and downs ever since. Yeah. No <laughs> kidding. But now with that, then how do you. When you're at network events, how do you connect with people? Because you can meet them, say what's up, hi. But what's your strategy, if you have any, to go and connect with people? Okay, you want to know the superpower to success? Let's do it. Okay, actually, there's two things. Number one, we got to get better at how we define success. Mm -hmm. uh, success oh. isn't a monetary thing. That could be a byproduct of it. But it, until you get it out of your mind that success is just money, you're never going to be successful. Mm -hmm. uh, success is so much more, right? Again, it may sound cheesy. It's true. I'm sorry. It is what it is, right? In the yeah. famous words of Max Holloway, who got robbed at UFC 251. Uh, yeah. It is what it, it is. is. And um, yeah, there's so much more fundamental about being confident, feeling good about yourself. And that yeah. stuff's achieved through failure. Uh, the line goes, uh, failure is just success not realized yet, yeah. uh, which is a one. great line. And I think that's important because if you don't experience failure, you'll never appreciate success. Therefore, you'll never actually have success, right? Uh, okay, so that's defining success. So figure out how to define success for yourself. Otherwise, you'll never have it. Now, how do you inject nitrogen into your ability to gain success mm -hmm. um it's very simple okay I, how about this i'm gonna go one step further the purpose of life i'm gonna answer the purpose of life here okay for you. why not somebody's watching this right now like whoa 
I didn't think this guy well, said, Simon, yeah. <laughs> well, give me that. Uh, okay, all right, here, here we, we go. go. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to make you wait. Uh, pause for a beat, then continue marching forward. The key to life, the purpose of life, is connection. Connection. It's that simple. Connecting with other people, connecting with nature, connecting with yourself. All right? Nice. This is the key. Nothing provides you more internal satisfaction than when you connect with something. And if you examine your life, you're going to realize that I'm, I'm telling the truth here. Uh, you will, I promise you. Now you go, okay, we know the purpose of life. Mm -hmm. How do we do that? How do we connect? Well, I'll tell you how to connect with people. It's simple. Commonality. Find the commonality between you mm -hmm. and another person, and uh, uh, um, highlight it, and build off of it. You will learn other things, but if we continue to focus on our differences in life, yeah. we are always divided. But if we want to connect, aka come together, yeah. we find our commonality. You know. Me and Glenn connected at the beginning of this conversation with commonality. Glenn, the name of my grandfather. I told a story about that. We found a bit of commonality. Glenn, into martial arts. I am also into martial arts. Uh, he's significantly better at it than I am. By like that's not even a, well, that's not in question. But there's commonality there, right? Yeah. And you know that's if you find that if you're at an event, don't try to interject yourself into ways of explaining how awesome you are. Right. Uh, no, don't be that person. Don't try to be in a room going like, how do I let this person know about my new thingamabobber that's the greatest thingamabobber mm -hmm. that ever thingamabob, right? Uh, they're not going to be impressed by you. They're going to be annoyed by you. Um, but what yeah. you do is you, you find out what's in common. Mm -hmm. And that's by asking questions and yep. listening. Listening is crucial. Absolutely. I haven't done a lot of it in this. Uh, <laughs> that's the ironies you're watching. You're like, I don't, I, don't, I don't think this guy's listening. He's just talking over there. Yeah, it's, I think <laughs> it's like a, it's a communication thing, right? And I think a lot of people, in terms of retaining what they hear from something or somebody, and, that, yeah. and just that skill, I think, is something that I've easily developed over the course of doing a show like this, where if we're sitting for an hour, I'm doing my best to be engaged and I noticed when I'm engaged I'm able to pull information mm. better and I see that especially when like um, shout out to Professor Monkey will run a technique and I'll see him do it and I'll listen and I'm like fuck I'm so zoned in yeah, yeah. and then I process it and then I go and I visualize I'm like okay I'm doing this and then often or not I'll understand the technique a lot quicker than peers mm. and I'm like man I, like I just understand it and then I'm able to add more do more off of it and imply and a apply the tool yeah it's either sharper or i'm able to use the tool sooner yes stuff like that and i think the listening aspect it comes with a lot of people have a problem with their waiting to reply yeah. and it's waiting to it's listening to understand or even one step further when i was uh, working at uh, architecture firm it was it was like listening i kind of developed this thought of listening to retell something or to teach somebody Okay. What I was, so it's like listening in order to convey to somebody else who doesn't know mm. something. It's like a, I was going around on a job site looking, 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 and I knew I had to share later that day what I had learned on yes. the job site. So I'm looking or listening to what the foreman or the contractor is saying with the intent of remembering to tell somebody who doesn't know later. Okay. And it's almost like a listening to understand and a listening to retell. Interesting. So, so would you say, um, Kind of a knowledge keeper. Yes. Yeah, I like that. Yeah. That's important. 100%. Civilizations were built yeah. off of knowledge keepers. Um, we're we're under the understanding that we just have to Google it to find yeah. information. Yeah. And there's there's nothing wrong with doing it to a certain degree, but if it's the only thing you're doing, so for example, I'm gonna guess you're somebody that likes to have conversation. 100%. When did you realize you were somebody that? Like, um, 
I think when I was in summer camp and I was running leadership stuff and I realized I was able to con- like connecting with people is so powerful. And then the build, the friendships you build aren't built because, well, you go through something together and it's not a crazy experience, but you're mm. wondering why it's like, well, it's the conversations we'd have up until 3 a.m. Uh-huh. and then realize it's too late to go back to bed. So you keep talking uh, and then so you wake bad. up and you keep going. Or when you're in South America and you're with a bunch of people you know a bit about and then you talk and you get philosophies and perspective of what they think. And then transferring all that moving forward three to five years later, now we're sitting down and I'm talking to you or or last week talking to Andre and it's, I don't know you guys past (laughs) what I've looked up on the internet or past the conversation I had with you at Mitchell Place. Yeah. Both of you guys. Mm -hmm. And then now learning all about this, learning that like he was married before, like like 20 years, I'm like, you're the son of my age, homie. Yes. Like (laughs) like just little things like, that's incredible. Yeah. You know, so things like that, knowing people like you guys who go through things that are difficult at the beginning and then building on that and then fast forward now. Yeah, love conversations. (sighs) Incredible thing for you to have. Uh, at uh, you know, not to, to play the age card because the age uh, um, life is 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 on this spectrum, and I think we focus on age way too much in life. Mm-hmm. But I will say, being able to develop certain skills early on yeah. uh, is just going to be beneficial to you in your life. 100%. Now, I I say that with a caveat. The caveat is that you're never too old. Okay. So I don't want anybody to watch this and they're 50 years old and they maybe haven't started pursuing their dream yet and they feel like, well, it's too late for me. Right, nobody's going to hire somebody who's this age or something. I can't tell you. Yes, there will be obstacles, but there will also be advantages. There's always an advantage somewhere. Mm -hmm. Experience is an advantage. Uh, Just a different perspective. A lot of organizations are slowly starting to realize that there has to be diversity within their groups in order for them Mm -hmm. to be better at what they do. And, I mean, I could go through a laundry list of examples of people that started really late, and they did it, and they achieved huge success, huge success. And you could do a quick Google search and find it out for yourself. So, again, I really want to speak to that audience, Mm -hmm. if that audience is listening, that... You know, I see it too many times. I've seen it with friends. I've seen it with, you know, acquaintances. This idea that when they get to a certain point that they're, they've, they, they've screwed up and that it's too late for them. This is not true. This is not a fact. This is just a, a worry. This is a fear and an, and an anxiety. Right. And you have it and just realize that that's not accurate. Yeah. And then it's at that point, once you get over those obstacles, it's as easy as you just got to do it. Just, just do it. Just do the thing. Just do it. And stick to it. And don't be all over the place. Yeah. Discipline, consistency, yeah. and yeah, starting. It's, yeah, just starting. And I know you're going to have a million ideas in your head like I did, but I found like once I decided to follow through on one idea, mm. then at stages I could focus on different ideas, nice. right? You know, I had to make sure my branding agency worked. I worked really hard over many years to get it to a point mm-hmm. where it, it, it provides jobs for other people. It helps uh, um, uh, our clients um, achieve the goals they want to achieve. It uh, provides a job for myself. Um, And so now I'm able to work on other businesses. And I've worked on so many other businesses, you know. Uh, For example, with Andre, you know. Big Bush. Big Bush. Shout out. Launching soon. Stay tuned. Pre-orders coming up. Get me one of those t-shirts before I... uh... Yeah, we're gonna have the gear soon too. Yeah, we got okay. okay. I got a question. Another, yeah. another question for you. Um, have you always been somebody that was able? And I know that this is gonna be true. I'm just gonna assume something onto him, but I'm gonna be right on this. Have you always been somebody that gets along with people of all ages? Yeah, hundred percent. I almost prefer people older because <laughs> I'm able to relate to them. Like it was, uh, it was funny because when uh, I think it was you who added me to the group with you, Mitch and Andre show to the three of you guys i was like uh what am i doing you know i was like i'm young as sh- not young as shit but i'm like i'm, <laughs> yeah, you are, you're I'm like i'm younger but i look at age as an experience thing i tie the two together because mm-hmm. i'm like i might not have business experience like the three of you or so, so i'm like what am i what am i bringing this what am i bringing to the table what do i i was like you know what glenn just just go <laughs> like have fun with it just be yourself like that's it that's all you can do and i'm like get there and have fun I'm like okay this is going well yeah it's smooth but yeah all ages older people I love old women old grandpas oh, yeah. I love how you I love <laughs> old women <laughs> I was like uh 
Wait a second. No, no there's like, not. Yeah. Hey, there's no shame in that. Never. Honestly, Never. Um, yeah, I, I'm I'm in the same boat. I've always been in the same boat. I was like, you know, shout out to my boy <laughs> Gary Brown. He's in his mid seventies. He's my coffee shop friend. I sit wow. down with him. He shares stories with me. Stories of things you would never think to look up, yeah. right? Like old rock coffee downtown. I love that place, and I would I would just sit there with him, and he'd tell me these stories about in the early seventies this happened in Sudbury or the sixties or whatever. Things that I would never know to even look up, like I wouldn't know to even Google that thing. And if you did, the documents and records of it aren't really that good on it. So you have people like that that are knowledge keepers, wow. and you sit down with them, and they share with you insights that you just it opens your world up, guys. Yeah. Stop being intimidated of older people. Stop thinking that there's something wrong with them because that's a problem with it is. when you're younger, right? Age, uh, ageist, you know, ageism, that, ageist, yeah, ageism. Yeah, don't don't be an ageist don't. because I'm. Pro I promise yeah. you are missing out. Stop being that person that's like, it was weird. I was creepy. Yeah. So weird. <laughs> it's like, okay, if you're a 13 year old little girl, you're accepted. My niece is accepted. Yeah. A couple of years past that, guys, <laughs> stop that nonsense. Could yeah. be weirded out by. You know what it is? I laugh about this all the time. It's like, everything's weird to young people because they're so inexperienced. Right, you get to a certain yeah. age, and it doesn't seem that weird because you're like, yeah, I've seen that like twenty times. Right. right, when you've never seen a thing before, you're like, it's so weird. Yeah. Well, <laughs> we got to cut to commercial. Oh, again. Yeah, yeah, we got okay, another, another commercial. message from our sponsors. Oh, well. What's going on, everybody? Pardon the interruption. I just want to stop again to give another shout out to one of my good friends, Kai and Lawton Schlager, aka Mister World Peace. My brother Kai in here is an artist. He's got the apparel company going. And overall, very energetic, positive, and very charismatic young man. So, check him out and get those vibes flowing. See what it's all about. Much love, brother. Keep doing you. Yeah, now all the people wondering, oh man, they're not experienced enough. Or they're inexperienced. So well, it's everything it weird up. when you first start out. Remember how yeah. dramatic you were in high school? Yeah. We were all super dramatic. Yeah. Everything is like, did you hear about like Tam and the thing and the dang? You're like, okay... That was a big deal. Yeah. Now you're just like, I feel like we live in a, like a global high school now. Because mm. like you're online. Yeah. And everything's like, Kanye West is running for president. What do you think um, about this? Oh, I think uh, it, yeah. Jada Pinkett Smith had an affair with somebody. Um, but, uh, d d d d like, let's go down the list of things that don't matter to us. Like they shouldn't matter to us. Yeah, 100%. Do I get caught up on it? The, yeah, they're not gonna twist it. One hundred percent. I get, I get, I get caught up in it. I don't want to, right? But I do, and I have to check myself. Um, <laughs> yeah, that, that's it. That's all I gotta say about that. I do like that you have that quality, though. Oh, I think man, it's gonna take you a long way. I'm looking forward to it. I'm yeah. really intrigued to see. It was like uh, at my birthday, like la not like uh, a week ago Wednesday. Yes. And when um, a lot of people. A good amount of people were like, oh, like you know how it is. People flood your phone with messages on your birthday or phone no, calls and stuff. Voice I don't know what it's like. Tell me more about what it's like to have friends <laughs> that people care about. You. Okay, so what happened? <laughs> what happened? <laughs> Anyways, they're like, uh, that's not true. <laughs> that's not. True. He's like, God, I hope that's not true. All right, fingers crossed. Yeah. Um, there was a, a few people. There was like a common theme. There were like four or five people were like. I'm looking forward to seeing how far you go with this. Like with mm. this. And I was like, fun. Yeah, it was pretty cool. So seeing like the potential that, because it's weird. Like, Man, you have great potential. I'm like, you don't almost notice it. That's something I find oh. it's weird to self-reflect. Oh, yeah. It's like, so how tough. do you look at yourself and think, okay, where could I go? What could I do with? You want to believe yeah, that stuff. 100%. But it's hard to know it. Yeah, I know what yeah, you're saying. Yeah, you can't really find it. You know it's there. Yes. And you know other people claim they see it. And you're like, yes. Whoa. Oh, isn't that the best yeah. thing when you do like, that? Am I colorblind and you can only see red? But I, yeah. How does this work? Well, this is something that I, I want to point out that I think is, it's an important part from an empathy point of view. Mm -hmm. So we all have like things that suck in our lives. We have things that are great. Everybody. Yes. 100%. Everybody does. Now, that's 
to varying degrees. Maybe the things in your life are way worse than anything I've ever experienced. And maybe the things that are great in your life are greater than anything I've experienced. I'll argue that because I mm -hmm. think that it's, you know, it may be different things, but it's how you experience it, okay? So, it's there's some people in life that don't actually have anybody that believes in them. Uh -huh. And that's something that really breaks my heart. And I, I, I forget it. And I think a lot of people forget it. And I'm hoping maybe some people here listening are realizing that there, we have to find this way to look at people. And maybe they're not achieving what you think you've achieved or achieving what you think they should be able to achieve. And you don't know anything about them. You don't know that maybe nobody ever believed in them. I can't imagine how difficult it is to build yourself into something that mm -hmm. society says you should be able to be yeah. if you've never had somebody to believe in you. I love how smooth that spike was. He was just like reached up. He's like, make sure that computer's still on. Yeah. Right? And I don't know yeah. if you see where I'm going with this. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll give you an, a little bit more um, context here. Mm -hmm. My office, my agency is right downtown. And, oh, yeah. and I'm right on Lisger Street. I've got big windows in the front. I'm inside the fish tank, as I call it, the fish nice. bowl. And people could look in, see us working, which is kind of fun. Yeah. And we could look out. And downtown, uh, it's awesome. I love downtown. But we have our problems. Like every downtown and every city in the world, it's not unique to having problems. No. And one of the biggest problems our world is facing is, is, is mental illness, drug abuse, all of these things. Oh, yeah. Homelessness. This is not something we get to just shove aside and pretend isn't happening because we're all we all all of our hands are dirty man mm -hmm. and uh mine included and uh, i see people every single day like just kind of going through the stuff that they're going through right. and sometimes i'm very frustrated by it very selfishly yeah. frustrated by it and i have to stop and, and and contemplate and think about it and go like what's this person's life about what what got them here and we got to deal with this in a better way Anyways, I don't want to get too serious on that. I don't want to get uh, seemingly political or anything like that. I don't think that's political. I think that's social. Right. But uh, it's something yeah, worth sure. thinking about. Having right. more empathy for people and, uh, you know, creative problem solving and, and, mm -hmm. and all that stuff. So. Right. And, there, and there's definitely something to that. And that's a perspective I think a lot of people get, whether it be where they work or when they go travel or... That's my big thing with the traveling mm. thing. Like that's why that's one of my passion driven hobbies. Oh wow. Yeah, it's a great <laughs> one. You the things that I'm able to see in downtown Romania, like downtown yeah, Bucharest. Yes. Or downtown like uh, Berlin mm. or downtown Barcelona or Paris or everything, like it's everywhere. Yes. Regardless of what city you yeah. come across, right? Like Bogota and Colombia, the same thing everywhere. It's incredible in yes. the worst way. Yeah, that it's you see it everywhere. Some places are worse, some, but no matter how bad it is, it's still there. What's your theory on this? I'm curious. Why do communities all continue to act like the issues happening in their community is unique to their community? Why do you think that is? I think it could be off of what I just touched on perspective. I think there's a lot. I think the majority don't have that big wide open perspective and go okay it's not or i can relate to this or this is why things are going on over here it's why when everyone's thinking of covid 19 and then there's a shooting in halifax which by the way is the largest one in canadian history wow wow 20 over 20 people were dead or mm. got gunned down and shot mm. and we're focused on all the black lives matters but not many people seem to be too crazy about like the Halifax shooting mm. and then same thing with co like COVID-19 and everything everything's going on that when you put one thing like 22 deaths going mm. on out east people don't really think about that too much because it's not happening here yeah it's things it's like perspective on you don't know what those families are going through because you can't relate and stuff mm. it's it's a lot it's I think a it's a perspective thing though to answer your question it is it is and uh it's um you know, I've got a buddy out in Halifax that I do some business with, mm -hmm. and uh, shout out to Justin Kelly, and he was like, yeah, he said like the whole community's shook, right? Like yeah. just so shook, and it's they're so close to it, and uh, 
Yeah, you touched on many things. Again, perspective is huge, right? Yeah. Perspective is uh, is uh, is a big one. It's what you know. I think who who says this? I think Ricky Gervais. He has this great like. I love like I love Ricky Gervais. Yeah, I think he's that. hilarious. Um, but I also love how he tries to explain comedy sometimes, and I think it's really useful to people to understand comedy. And he talks about a couple of different things, but the big one is, oh no, was this him? Okay, I'm just going to attribute it to him, yeah. and then you guys look it up online and prove me wrong in the comment section below. Nice. So we'll get you engaging somehow. So figure out who actually said this. And basically it was like, you don't get to laugh. You don't get to choose what you're offended by. You can't laugh at every single joke that's made, but then the one joke that's about you and the group you associate yourself with, all of a sudden you get offended by that joke. It doesn't work that way. You don't get to laugh at everybody else but yourself. You'll sit there and you'll laugh at the uh, the ethnic jokes. You'll sit there and laugh about the celebrity jokes. And then all of a sudden a fat joke comes up and you're offended. Whoa, 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 whoa. whoa, whoa. Yeah. Wait, where were you when the offensive things were happening you're to laughing the different at the racist groups? jokes. You got it. But not. Exactly. Yeah. So that's a, an important thing to keep in mind is that right. just because it's not your plight doesn't mean that it's not worthy of having your empathy, right? And so I think if you are you have to make a decision. You have to make mm -hmm. a decision to laugh at everything. If the comedian is punching up, right. it's once the comedian's punching down, that's where I think a lot of people miss out on uh, miss out in comedy. So mm -hmm. when you're clearly talk like if you're just talking about somebody that's a part of a disenfranchised group and you're in like the maybe the more dominant group it doesn't feel right you right. know it just it doesn't feel funny it feels more like bullying yeah then when the oppressed group makes fun of the dominant group for right. some reason that works because it's like you're giving them some comeuppance whether mm -hmm. it's valid or not anyways that's a whole discussion right. that i think is very valuable nice. and uh, i agree with you it's more people need to spend more time learning about different groups, different 100%. cities, different communities, and they will realize that the world is so much bigger than our community. Mm -hmm. That's not to say that our community isn't important. It's right. just that certain problems aren't unique to, to Sudbury right. and Sudbury's downtown. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. But there's definitely, like you said, homeless, drug problem everywhere. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't know what the answer to, I don't know what the solution mm -hmm. is either. I come I up know. with like theories in my head. I'm like, maybe this will work. And then right? someone's like, well, what about, I don't know. Yeah. Maybe not. It could, but there's trials, tribulations and stuff. I wish there was this way for a group of people to be organized and they could all sit and spitball ideas and not be critiqued in a really toxic way about it. Like, if somebody's idea is really not great or you view it as super problematic, instead of canceling them, you go, let's build off this idea, let's throw other ideas in there, and let's not hold it against this person for having a bad idea. Mm -hmm. Because that's what holds people back from sharing their, their ideas. Is right. that fear, fear of, of like, oh, shit, I missed a corner on that, and that wasn't a very good one, and now right. I'm not valuable anymore, right? Mm -hmm. Right, and I think, too, that... That would almost come with a moderator and a specific group of people mm. who maybe not, if not all know each other, but there's all like a commonality yeah. amongst all of them. Because like you said, then that connection is formed. You're a friend and you won't belittle their idea yes. in front of a group of your peers. Yeah, yeah. I And again, I think that, uh, yeah, people that are very experienced mm -hmm. in that are, are super valuable. Right. Glenn, it's buddy, in those place. how many more, like, like, so how many of these have you done so far? This will be episode 30. I did episode 37 on the Thursday night, and then I did uh, 36 with Andre last Sunday. Dude, that's so incredible. So, yeah, Good man. for you, man. Yeah, I'm thanks. so happy to be part of this, man. Me this too. I like, so really appreciate your time. I appreciate your uh, enthusiasm, especially. Um, I have one kind of question that I'm curious about. Okay. Um, so... Sure. Through my whole research process, before we take off, I think it would be a cool way to end it. You're what I would call as well somebody who is an experiment mentor, right? Mm. You like to experiment yeah. and try different things. And how would you advise somebody to build experimenter habits so that you don't fall into a rut? That could be personal, professional relationships, or even like business. Yeah 
like stuff like that. How would you build those experimenter habits? So the go out and learn, always yeah. be ambitious for that. Yeah. How do you build those habits? That's a great question. There's many ways for me to, uh, to enter into this question. So I think that it requires a bit of a mindset that um, nothing's the end of the world except for the end of the world, right? Um, that, that maybe being a little bit less fearful mm -hmm. and saying, let me just try this thing to see what will happen. And doing that and starting off in low stake situations, so the stakes aren't high, right? Like, don't um, begin your career as a tightrope walker, tightrope walking from, you know, uh, the CN Tower to yeah. wherever, right? You guys get the reference. Start on the ground <laughs> with a string across, walk across it, move on up from there. You guys get it. Uh, just really apply that analogy to whatever it is you're doing and do like low stake risk now there's two ways is like there's planning do you want to plan not to the point of over planning okay so being uh, being prepared through planning and being prepared through practice those are two different things okay this is really important you'll hear a lot of people say like uh oh i just wing it right and some people are oblivious to how good they are at winging it. Some people are terrible at winging it. Mm -hmm. And they live in this constant loss cycle. Um, and I think winging it is really good for people who are intuitive to the thing they're doing. Mm -hmm. And so you're not ever going to be just naturally at a very elite level of the thing you're doing if you don't practice the thing a lot. Right. Right. And so you could, let's say, public speaking, for example. Mm -hmm. Well, some people could wing it. And the reason why they can wing it, so for example, I can wing it. 100%. Why can I wing it? Because I've got years and years and years of practice. Right, you have that skill. You're confident. I practiced it. it. Yeah. I'm not winging it from a place of nothing. Mm -hmm. That's just going up there and going like, I've never done this before and I'm going to wing it. No. Don't do right? That. Yeah. And then depending on the topic, that's where... Um, planning comes into place mm -hmm. so practice will lead you to being prepared and planning will lead you to being prepared right and so uh i think that two of those things are you know uh are very important for you to do in your life so low stakes mm -hmm. practice and you know lifelong planning yeah. i think that helps i don't know yeah, maybe definitely. there's some there's some personality things as well mm -hmm. i tend to say to my younger friends that are in their 20s mm -hmm. I always say, just take chances, quit jobs, start new jobs. Like, yeah. don't get locked into a life of mediocrity yeah. unless that's what you want. Right. Um, now is the time. It feels like it could be the end of the world sometimes when you're 23, yeah. 24, 25, and you get fired and you're like, I'm screwed. It is not. Because if you quit, quit things, start new things, you're actually getting different looks. And so that when you're in your 30s, you've just got like so many different things to draw upon. It right. makes you such a valuable asset in the marketplace. Right. The marketplace of life, my friend. The marketplace of life, my <laughs> friend, he says. That's good. I like that a lot. All right. You want yeah. another uh, m &M? Yeah, I'll definitely crush an M&M. Okay, let's do Close that. The show. Yeah, let's do that. So, this awesome. episode was brought to you by the people at m and Unbeknownst to them, they're totally unaware of it. But hopefully, the check is in the mail. We'll see you soon. <laughs> All right, Cliff. Hey, dude, that was really awesome. Let's it. do this. Yes, okay, sir. my man, this is awesome. Yes, awesome. All yeah, right. I really appreciate your time, your enthusiasm. Yeah. Thanks, guys, for tuning in. Like, comment, subscribe, follow, share, follow Clifton, Big Bush, everything. I enjoy you guys, and I'll see you next time. Thank you. <laughs>